Good evening and a warm welcome. I'm Robert Dycraft, the director, Leon Levy Professor at the Institute of Advanced Study. I have a, this is a public lecture, particularly on the occasion of our semi-annual Board of Trustees meeting, so a particular warm welcome to all our board members. Um, it's rare uh, for a bit of science news to be on all the front pages of all the newspapers, but I think this is actually what happened on April 10th of this year when the first image uh, optical image of the, of the radio image of a black hole appeared. Uh, I must say, actually, I was uh, uh, ended up uh, at the, well, there were press conferences all over the world. Uh, I happened to be at the one in Brussels, which was actually in the center of the European bureaucratic black hole, uh, the, 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 the main building of the European Commission. And, uh, and actually, when the image was shown, there was a standing o ovation and the EU commissioner said that never happens uh, in the EU. And I must say next door there was a meeting where the heads of state were conferring uh, with uh, Theresa May about Brexit. And uh, <laughs> you can imagine the black hole meme was, <laughs> was everywhere. Uh, so terrific to invite you to this discussion about galactic black holes, particularly the one in the Milky Way. And I don't think there's a better person uh, here to lead that discussion, then Scott Tremaine, who has been the Richard Black Professor in the School of Natural Sciences, and it's wonderful to have uh, Rick and Helen here in the, there you are, in the audience. Um, Scott worked on many things, planets, comets, stars, black holes, galaxies, uh, did discoveries with the Kuiper belt of comets, structure of the rings of Saturn, the double nuclei in galaxies like the Andromeda, and if I just overseeing your uh, list of achievements, Scott, I'm just wondering what ha have we done, you know? <laughs> you covered some, uh, uh, almost all of the universe. Uh, as you know, and the image is here, that uh, one of the surprises, actually, at the unveiling of that image is that nobody knew which of the two black holes we we're going to see. We knew the astronomers were studying both the black hole in the galaxy M87, uh, which is very far away from us, and the one in the Milky Way, um, and it turned out to be not the one in the Milky Way. But actually, this kind of is, is the subject today. So if you were surprised whether perhaps the image and the title are not quite coinciding, this was done on purpose. Um, because I think, the, uh, as we'll hear, that second black hole might be even much more interesting. So we are looking into the future, not into the past. Um, Scott will give a presentation and then we'll be joined by three uh, panel members um, that are listed here. Uh, three former members of the Institute for Advanced Study. I'm uh, very happy to say uh, membership at IES is a great predictor for success. Uh, Tim Dezee, Elena Marchikova and uh, Dimitrios Pscheltis. Uh, I will introduce them at uh, greater length uh, after Scott's presentation, but now I first want to give the word to you, Scott. Well, if you, if you look up on a, a dark night, you'll see a hazy band of light um, across the sky. Uh, it's formed from uh, millions of stars that can't be individually distinguished by the naked eye. Of course, this is the Milky Way. It's the home galaxy for our solar system. Uh, it contains about 100, million, 100 billion stars, and it looks like a band because it's a disk, and we're located inside the disk. It doesn't look like a flat disk here, but that's a distortion uh, of the camera. Um, what's also striking here is the mottled appearance. That's due to clouds of small interstellar particles. You can think of as dust or haze that float in, within the disk of stars and obscure more distant stars from us. Uh, these are important because they're the raw ingredients for making planets like ours, but they do make it much harder to study the Milky Way. Uh, in particular, the center of the Milky Way is about 30,000 light years away, roughly in that distance, but it's largely obscured uh, by the dust and haze. Uh, the Milky Way is uh, one of uh, many billions of galaxies uh, in the universe uh, with a, uh, a wide variety of shapes and sizes. Um, I feel I should warn you that when you look at these images, first of all, you should ignore all the little point-like uh, uh, things. Those are just stars in our own galaxy in the foreground that we uh, are seeing because we're 
peering out from within the disk of the Milky Way. And you should also be skeptical about the colors. Astronomers take a certain amount of uh, latitude in uh, 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 enhancing and adjusting the colors to bring out the contrast and the uh, 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 faint features. Um, traditionally, galaxies are, are, are compared to islands in the universe. Uh, but maybe a better analogy is to think of them as, a, as an astronomical ecosystem. Uh, stars are born from the galaxy's interstellar gas. They orbit around within the galaxy. After they die, their mass is recycled to enrich the interstellar gas and help make new stars in the galaxy. Uh, in particular, the material that makes up uh, the solar system and our own bodies comes from throughout the Milky Way galaxy, but none of it comes from the other galaxies that we see today. And when the sun uh, ends its life in uh, seven billion years and incinerates the Earth, uh, the material on, on the Earth will eventually become part of uh, new stars and planets in the Milky Way. Um, I'd like to talk in particular uh, about two galaxies uh, uh, here. Uh, this is not the Milky Way, it's another galaxy which is a pretty close analog to the Milky Way. Uh, uh, if it were the Milky Way, you know, the sun would be somewhere out here. Um, the spiral arms that you see are structures that form and dissolve within the disk of stars and gas on time scales of about 1% of the age of the universe. Uh, the second galaxy is uh, uh, M87, which Robert has already alluded to. It's a much larger galaxy uh, in which the, the gas and interstellar material is uh, gone. Star formation has stopped. Uh, in the ecosystem analogy, you could think of this as uh, uh, desert, uh, but uh, maybe a better analogy is to think of it as a 55 plus community uh, in which uh, uh, the old stars are still living their lives, but there's not any young ones around. Um, I'm going to be talking about black holes both in the center of the Milky Way and, and M87. Just to remind you, a black hole is an inevitable prediction of Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity. It's a region of space time that contains a singularity that's surrounded uh, by an event horizon, a region in which the gravitational effects are so strong that nothing, uh, not even light, uh, uh, can escape from it. Uh, paradoxically, although the black hole doesn't emit any light, uh, the region just outside the event horizon can be among the brightest structures uh, in the universe. Uh, the light comes from uh, gas that's orbiting the black hole gradually releasing energy as its uh, orbit decays due to friction and the gas spirals inwards towards uh, the event horizon. Uh, these structures are called uh, accretion disks, and although we've never actually seen one, we understand their physics uh, very well, in large part uh, due to work done uh, in the 1970s by Rashid Sunyayev. I'm putting Rashid's picture uh, up here because he's in the audience, and I want you to know what all the people uh, who have contributed to this look like, so you can, if it turns out they're their, your neighbor, you can ask them questions about what's going <laughs> on. Um, uh, black holes can have spin. Um, uh, they can have angular momentum, and if a black hole is spinning, it can funnel material away from the accretion disk uh, to form the jets, uh, like those uh, uh, pictured on this illustration. Uh, they're remarkably straight, they're remarkably well collimated, and even more remarkably, they travel almost at the speed of light. Um, we're, uh, we believe that uh, black holes are present in most, many or most galaxies, and uh, uh, there's a, there was already some evidence for that in one of the images I showed you before. If you look carefully at the image of M87, you can see a jet emerging uh, from the center of the galaxy. If you look at uh, that with higher resolution, uh, with the Hubble telescope, uh, the jet looks like this. Again, remarkably uh, straight and well collimated. Um, it has an irregular structure, a set of blobs that uh, imply that the flow of material uh, uh, from the accretion disk into the jet varies irregularly. Uh, this is a process that we don't understand yet, but it is one that we can exploit. Uh, if you compare images taken by the Hubble telescope over the span of five years, uh, they're kind of fuzzy, but you can see the blobs, and you could pretty well connect the uh, blobs at different times. And by doing that connection, 
you can figure out how fast the blobs are moving. Um, it turns out they're moving very close to the speed of light. Um, that's, as I said, an inevitable prediction for jets emerging from black holes, but a speed that's impossible to achieve uh, in any other astrophysical system that we know of. Uh, so that's one argument uh, for black holes in the centers of galaxies. A second uh, quite different argument uh, comes from quasars. Uh, quasars are mysterious objects that look star-like uh, when we look at them from, from the Earth. They're found in the centers of distant galaxies. They're extremely luminous. A single quasar can send out a thousand times uh, the light of, uh, from the whole galaxy. Um, and although they're very luminous, they're also very small. They're not much larger uh, than our own solar system and a million times smaller uh, than their host galaxy. The only way we, we know of to uh, get so much energy out of such a small volume uh, is accretion onto a massive black hole. And this is an in, another indirect argument um, as to why uh, black holes must be common in galaxies. Moreover, uh, quasars were several hundred times uh, more numerous um, uh, when the universe was much younger, when it was about, they were most common when the universe was about 20% of its current age. It's a, a time in the history of the universe sometimes called cosmic noon. Now I guess we're in the middle of the afternoon. Um, and these simple arguments <coughs> um, lead to a syllogism. Um, that's very simple to explain. If black holes are the power source for quasars, and if quasars are much more rare now than they were when the universe were young, was young, and if quasars are found in the centers of galaxies, then many nearby galaxies must contain massive black holes that used to be quasars and that now no longer shine. Uh, that simple argument has motivated a massive effort uh, by astronomers over the past several decades to find the massive black holes, what, what are in effect uh, dead quasars uh, that should be located at the centers of uh, many or most nearby galaxies. Uh, this, this possibility, of course, raises the question of how the massive black holes form. In general, to form a black hole, you need to pack a large amount of mass into a small amount of volume. You took the sun and compressed it by a million times until it was about uh, a mile in size, uh, you could make a black hole out of that. Uh, but of course this is not easy and astronomers spent a lot of time worrying about the various possible ways to make black holes. Um, and a critical uh, contribution uh, there came from, from, from Martin Rees who made a, uh, one of these famous diagrams that changes everybody's point of view of how things work. Uh, he pointed out he, the, the diagram summarizes a, a wide variety of ways of making black holes, relativistic clusters of stars, supermassive stars, et cetera, et cetera. But what Martin pointed out is that they all end up in a black hole. And so what he basically said in this article was, get a life, stop worrying about uh, whether this mechanism or that mechanism makes the black hole. Uh, just accept the fact that the black hole is there and go on and think about what the consequences are. Um, several decades later, that argument has proved to be prescient. We still don't understand how the black holes form. But as I hope you'll see, and we now have a very good understanding of many of the consequences of their, uh, of their presence. Um, so through these and, and many other arguments, uh, we have very strong circumstantial evidence that black holes are present in the centers of galaxies, but it's still circumstantial. Uh, what we would like to see is the actual black hole. Now the standard argument is, well, they're black. Uh, it's not so easy to see them. But in fact, if we could see uh, an accretion disk such as this surrounding a black hole, um, that would be uh, certainly very persuasive evidence and I think plenty for, for, for most of us. Um, the problem is not that they're black, but that they're very small. And uh, to perhaps set the scale, I'm going to try to make a terrestrial analogy uh, and uh, compare the black hole uh, to uh, Mecca. Um, now, Mecca, that, there are two reasons for doing that. One is that Mecca is uh, 10,000 kilometers from Princeton, which is a nice round number. Uh, it also has a disk of uh, stuff orbiting around it. Um, the, um, 
so if we, if we took the, if we scaled the Milky Way so that uh, the sun was at the distance of Mecca, um, the scale on this diagram uh, would be about a centimeter. Uh, so far smaller than the scale in this picture. Um, and what that tells you is that the, uh, uh, it's going to be extremely hard to see the, the immediate neighborhood of the black hole unless you take extreme efforts. Um, that the, the level at which you can uh, uh, resolve these things um, is called the angular resolution. It's the ability to distinguish objects uh, close together on the sky. Um, uh, it's measured in degrees, which uh, we're all familiar with. Uh, you subdivide a degree into 60 arc minutes, 60 arc minutes into 60 arc seconds, uh, 60 arc seconds into 1,000 milli arc seconds, and a milli arc second into 1,000 micro arc seconds. And we're going to be talking on the scale of micro arc seconds. Uh, for comparison, uh, the moon is about half a degree or 30 arc minutes apart. Um, if you have 2020 vision, uh, you can resolve about one arc minute. Um, the uh, blurring due to the atmosphere that uh, limits the resolution of any uh, telescope, no matter how large, is about one arc second. The Hubble Space Telescope was put above the uh, atmosphere to eliminate that blurring. Because of that, it's been able to achieve 50 milli arc seconds. Uh, the largest ground-based telescopes now use adaptive optics to, to cancel the atmospheric blurring, and they can now be competitive with the Hubble telescope. Um, but the expected size of the event horizon for the Milky Way's black hole is 10 micro arc seconds, so uh, order, over three orders of magnitude uh, smaller than uh, the biggest telescopes uh, we now have at uh, uh, visual wavelengths. Now, this, the usual solution is if you want more resolution, build a bigger telescope. The trouble is that the resolution goes roughly like the inverse of the mirror diameter, uh, and the cost of the telescope goes roughly like the cube of the miller, mirror diameter. So if you increase the mirror diameter by a factor of two, it costs you eight times as much, but you only gain a factor of two in resolution. Um, the solution to this <coughs> can be illustrated by a cartoon. Here's a cartoon telescope. Uh, it's a very big one, as you can see. Um, I'm going to mask over the, uh, the lens or the aperture of the telescope and then I'm going to cut two small holes in the aperture. As long as those holes are at the edge of the aperture, the light coming through those will still give the same resolution that you got from the whole telescope. There will be problems, of course, the, uh, you won't get as, many, as much light through, but the resolution will be the same. And so the, the obvious idea is just build two small telescopes with the same separation and combine the light uh, from the telescopes uh, at the back end. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to doing this. This technique is called an interferometer. The advantage is that you get the same angular resolution at far less cost. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, is you have much less light gathering power. You do lose some of the information about uh, the image. And you have to combine the two signals without losing any phase information, which in the case of, of uh, optical wavelengths means you have to uh, uh, match the light paths through the two small telescopes um, to an accuracy of about a millionth of an inch. Um, despite these challenges, uh, uh, dozens of interferometers have been built uh, around the world. This is a, a, a sample of them uh, at different wavelengths, some optical, uh, some at radio wavelengths. Uh, and I'm going to uh, focus for the rest of the talk on three specific interferometers uh, that are being used to study the black hole in the center of the Milky Way. Uh, this is a telescope at the European Southern Observatory uh, at 8,600 feet in Chiro Paranal, uh, a mountain in the Atacama Desert of northern Chile. Uh, there are four telescopes. This is one of the, the main telescopes. It has a mirror diameter of uh, 27 feet that's figured accurately to about a millionth of an inch. Uh, the laser, the, the bright lights are lasers that are sent to the, in, in, that reflect off the upper atmosphere to provide artificial guide stars that are used to compensate uh, for atmospheric blurring. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions about it, um, the former director is in the audience. Uh, 
This is the, the whole observatory, four large telescopes and a set of movable uh, uh, small telescopes. Um, and these telescopes have been com combined in exactly the way I described uh, to make an interferometer. Um, the, um, this sort of illustrates the way the interferometer works. The effective diameter of the telescope they make uh, is this, which is about 420 feet. Uh, they can combine it with the small movable telescopes to get an even larger effective resolution. And then what happens is that the light from each of the four big telescopes and the small telescopes is brought to a common room uh, and combined uh, uh, and to, uh, to produce an image. And that's an, uh, the, the, the corridor that the beams come along. And again, all of this has to be done accurate to about a millionth of an inch. Um, to get an idea of what you can see in the center of the galaxy uh, uh, with, with, with this, this is an interferometer, this is a uh, uh, zoom in picture zooming in towards the center of the galaxy. It gradually switches from visible wavelengths to infrared wavelengths where the haze is less strong. As it gets close enough to the center, it'll switch uh, from a static image to a time repeating time lapse uh, movie showing the positions of the stars over an interval of 20 years. We're now maybe a few light years uh, from the center, and as you get closer and closer to the center, uh, you can actually start to see the stars move uh, relative to one another because the scales are getting smaller and smaller. This is about the limit of resolution of an ordinary telescope. We now switch uh, to the uh, results from the interferometer and loop through an image of the movement of these stars uh, over about 20 years. Focus in particular on that bright star uh, near the center. Um, after 20 years of observation, um, this is what the, the motion of that uh, star looks like. Um, it turns out it has a period of about 16 years. The scale here, uh, this is Pluto's orbit. Um, the, the, the orbit can be fit extremely well to uh, an orbit around a a central body. Uh, you can, from the shape of the orbit, you can determine where that central body has to be, even if it's not seen, and it turns out to coincide exactly with the position of the black hole that's been inferred uh, uh, from other mechanisms. Uh, one of the impressive things about this is that the interferometer I described uh, was uh, uh, actually uh, proposed and funded around this part of the orbit with the expectation that it would be finished in time to observe the point of closest passage to the black hole, which occurred last year in 2018. It was indeed finished on time, and you can see here how you could watch the star move on a daily basis uh, past the black hole at a distance, maybe twice Pluto's orbit. Um, for astronomers who are used to uh, uh, stars moving on orbits with periods of uh, hundreds of millions of years, it's mind-boggling to see uh, something moving on a night-to-night -night basis. In terms of the, the terrestrial comparison, I've just projected the orbit at the right size onto my, uh, onto my image of Mecca. Um, so what have we learned from this? Um, uh, by fitting this orbit to the, to the uh, properties that we, uh, you know, to, of the, of the black hole, we now know the distance to the black hole and therefore presumably the distance to the center of the galaxy. Uh, it's 26,670 light years with an uncertainty of a third of a percent. We know the mass of the black hole uh, just under uh, 4.2 million solar masses with an uncertainty of a third of a percent. So I now know the mass of the black hole in the center of the galaxy with an accuracy better than I know my own weight. Um, if it's not a black hole, uh, we know that uh, whatever uh, mass is, is causing this star to orbit it um, has to be in a, in a region smaller than the size of the solar system, and we don't know of any other system other than a black hole in standard physics uh, that can be that dense. The second interferometer uh, I'm going to talk about is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. Uh, it consists of 66 movable telescopes. Uh, they can be separated by up to uh, 10 miles. Uh, it's located at over 16,000 feet, again in the Atacama Desert, northern Chile, one of the highest and driest sites uh, on Earth. 
Um, the dishes are all movable because you're trying to fill out the aperture of the big telescope that you're uh, replacing, uh, even though each of them weighs over, over 100 tons. And the frequencies that it's sensitive to are similar to those that you see in the millimeter wave scanners that uh, are now appearing at airports. Um, this uh, interferometer has been used by uh, Lena Merchakova, uh, a member here, uh, to look at the galactic center. Uh, the images uh, look a little blurry and not spectacular, but uh, they're very important. What she sees is gas close to the location of the black hole marked by the green cross. Uh, the gas is traveling at speeds of up to 1,000 kilometers per second, far larger than you see elsewhere in the galaxy. Um, and on one side, the gas is moving towards us. On the other side, it's moving away from us. And the only configure, the inevitable configuration that produces that effect uh, is a disk. Um, so the observations suggest that we're seeing a disk of material orbiting around uh, the black hole. Again, uh, this is the, the image of Mecca uh, to the same scale. And the reason I think that this uh, discovery is important uh, and exciting is that it may be some of the first direct evidence we have uh, for a disk of the kind that's been predicted uh, around black holes for the last several decades. Okay, the third interferometer uh, I'm going to describe is the Event Horizon Telescope, for which uh, Demetrius Psaltis is the uh, uh, program scientist. Um, this is the most ambitious uh, interferometer uh, you can imagine. The idea is to use the entire Earth as a baseline. Uh, so what they've done is to combine a set of telescopes, uh, one in Spain, uh, one in Chile, uh, a third uh, in, uh, in, in Mexico, and others in uh, uh, Arizona, Hawaii, and even the South Pole. Uh, to make a single interferometer whose largest baseline is uh, uh, several thousand miles. There's a huge number of challenges uh, to make this work. Um, ev every site has to have good weather. Um, every telescope has to work well at the same time. Um, and because the telescopes are so far apart, um, you can't combine the signals uh, just by, by running a cable from, from one to the other. Uh, you might think that the natural thing to do is just send the data over the internet. Um, the trouble is that the uh, amounts of data uh, involved are enormous. Uh, the data in their most recent observing run was five petabytes, which is equivalent to downloading 100,000 movies on Netflix. Um, so the only way that you can uh, 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 manage this data is to save all of the data on hard drives synchronized by clocks that are accurate to a hundredth of a microsecond. Um, to save all the data required something like a ton of hard drives. Um, they're similar to the ones in your laptop, except uh, your laptop doesn't work at high altitude. And so these hard drives had to be hermetically sealed and filled with uh, helium. Once you have all the data, you then ship all of the hard drives uh, to a common site and do the data analysis, uh, but not, not quite. Uh, for the hard drives from the, the South Pole Telescope, you have to wait four months until the Antarctic winter is finished. Planes can come in, get the hard drives, and fly them out. Um, as Robert said, the, uh, the press release on this, the first announcement on this, uh, was uh, on April 10th. Uh, and only at that point did we learn that rather than looking at uh, the center of the Milky Way, they were going to look at the center of uh, M87. We'd already uh, 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 published the title. It was too late to change the arrangements, so uh, we'll just have to um, come back when the next uh, press release comes out. But I will tell you about the image uh, from M87. Um, this, is, this is what's been on the front page of, the, of all, all the newspapers in the world, and I want to try to orient you to uh, uh, what it means and doesn't mean. Uh, first, in terms of scale, uh, this distance is 50 micro arc seconds. In comparison, again, the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope is about 1,000 times worse. Um, M87 is about 1,000 times further than the Milky Way, but fortunately, its black hole is 1,000 times bigger than the one in the Milky Way, so they're comparable in angular size. 
but it does mean that uh, the, sun, the solar system looks pretty small uh, compared to this figure. Um, there's the event horizon, and it's natural to assume that uh, um, you know, the reason it's black in here is because nothing can come out of the black hole, uh, but the actual interpretation is somewhat more complicated uh, and can really only be done uh, by doing detailed numerical calculations. The reason it's so complicated is that the gravity from the black hole is so strong that light doesn't travel in straight lines close to the black hole, and in order to follow the, the curving orbits, you really have to do everything with careful numerical calculations. This is an example of one of many thousands of uh, calculations that the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration did. Uh, it's a swirling uh, uh, disk of accretion disk around the black hole. There's the event horizon, and you can see that outside the event horizon is a ring called the photon ring. This is basically a caustic. It's a uh, region in which the curved light rays from uh, many different areas of the disk of gas around the black hole happen to converge and come towards us uh, from the same angle. That's why it's bright. If you then take the simulation and blur it with the limited resolution you know the Event Horizon Telescope has, uh, you get an image like this, which as you can see, uh, looks remarkably similar to the actual image. Uh, so that's what you're seeing. Uh, the remaining thing to understand is why it's uh, uh, bright on one side. Uh, to understand that, uh, remember the jet from M87. Um, we believe that the jet stays straight all the way from the event horizon out to the distances uh, we see. So that means that the axis of the jet should be the same on the much larger uh, uh, figure. Moreover, the jet comes out through the pole of the, uh, 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 of the spinning black hole. That means that the, the equator of the black hole should be perpendicular to the jet and presumably the disk is rotating in the, the equator of the black hole. That means that the uh, uh, plane of the disk uh, is roughly like this. This angle is pointed away from us, the line of sight, by about 17 degrees. If the disk is spinning this way, then the material coming through this part of the disk is coming towards us. It's traveling at such high speeds. Uh, that its brightness is boosted, just the way a train sounds louder, louder if it's coming toward you than if it's coming away from you. So basically, the, sorry, the, the bright ring that you're seeing is simply the result of material in the disk that's coming towards you and having its emission boosted. Okay, let me, let me then close with one final uh, remark. The, the black hole in the Milky Way uh, contains only about a hundredth of one percent sorry, about a hundredth of one percent of the mass of the stars in the Milky Way. So you might think that it's an exotic but very minor component of the galaxy, but its influence uh, could be much larger. Although its mass is small, the energy that was released in forming it is something like a hundred times more than the energy that was released in forming all of the stars uh, in, the, in, in the galaxy. And the central unanswered question in studying galaxy formation is what fraction of the energy released in forming the black hole uh, is coupled or fed back into the rest of the stars and gas. If even 1% of that uh, is fed back, then the black hole plays a critical role in determining the formation and evolution of the rest of the, the galactic ecosystem. And that, I think, is the central question in trying to understand uh, formation of galaxies today. Okay, let me stop there and turn it back over to Robert. So thank you so much, uh, Scott, for this uh, wonderful, uh, succinct, and, and, and fascinating introduction. So very happy that we now have uh, three, uh, three of your colleagues to, uh, to lead the discussion. Just starting uh, on, on your right, uh, Tim De Zeeuw. So first of all, all three, as was made very clear, are former members of the Institute. Uh, and, current. and current members, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's Unless true. Unless you know something we yes. don't. Yes, no. <laughs> future, future former member. Uh, um, so, Tim De Zeeuw, actually, for me, uh, was a serious case of imprinting. I think you were the first person I met when I, as a graduate student, came here to the Institute. and remember very much our discussion. Uh, Tim was a, 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 a five-year member here from 1984 to 89. 
uh, came from Leiden, then you went back to Leiden, became a professor of theoretical astronomy. You were, uh, as was mentioned, director general of the European Southern Observatory from 2007 through 2017. Have many, many distinctions. I just want to mention among one of them, the Brouwer Award from the American Astronomical Society. Then uh, Lena, Lena Machukova, you are your current member, the Bezos member. Um, you uh, got your PhD from Caltech uh, last year in 2018. And, um, and as we've seen, uh, you uh, have done very exciting research and your, your paper uh, discovering this new disk uh, among the Milky Way black hole is just recently being accepted in Nature. It's wonderful. And uh, very important too, you were uh, a science consultant to the movie Interstellar. <laughs> And then finally, uh, Dimitrios, uh, Dimitrios Psaltis, you uh, are chair of the Theoretical Astronomy, Astronomy Astrophysics Program at the University of Arizona, and quite important, uh, also a long-term member here at the Institute, 2001-2003, uh, and uh, you are a project scientist on the Event Horizon Telescope, and perhaps asking with you, and just, just kind of a human question, so uh, you still remember the first day you saw the image of M87, and what did you think when you saw the image? Yeah, it was July 25th, 2018, about 10 in the morning. 10 <laughs> a.m. in the morning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things that uh, it was a big relief. Because, relief? Yeah, because for about a decade, we put all our effort in trying to make that project work, having no idea whether, first of all, it will work, and second, what will nature show us. It could have been a blob of nothing yeah. that just had the right size. And um, as we were getting closer and closer to that, we were getting more and more nervous. And it was an enormous relief to see. And was there really one moment when the image was produced and you, or did it like slowly emerge? No, it was really one moment. One moment. Yes, it was, it, it was a very, it is so loud in the data that it took almost no effort. W we had everything behind closed doors. We tried to do all the analysis without looking because that was very important for us. And when we had all the calibration and the analysis done, then it was really a matter of three seconds to, to get And did you image. celebrate that day? Uh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> we knew that we had a long way in front of us. We celebrate on April 10th. Yes. One question just immediately have to ask, and I know also it was asked from your other colleagues <laughs> on the press conferences, you know, this was the one black hole, but what about the other? And uh, are, are you willing to share anything, you know, when, when we get these results? Uh, started sounding like a congressional hearing. Yes. Um, so we have the data for both black holes and the instrument worked beautifully. We actually did all the analysis up to the imaging for everything simultaneously. The main difference is that the black hole in M87 is very massive, so it stays still for us for the course of a night during the observations. The one in the center of the Milky Way moves a little bit, the image changes a little bit during the night and we can see directly to in the data. From so day to day, because well you're absorbing on four consecutive even nights. Even through the right? night, through the it changes. Night. So from the beginning of the night to the end of the night, we observe over about 12 hours as the Earth rotates, and through the night, the image slightly evolves. So we want to be super careful before we get something out that is super blurry. We want to make it sharp and make it good, but it's going to be spectacular. <coughs> and we have to wait. About eight months, maybe. Eight months, okay, great, because uh, I heard one to ten years, but so this is sound much better. <laughs> yeah. uh, Lena, just also for you, um, uh, when you, particularly also with your interest in the kind of these accretion disks, you know, when, what were you looking for when you saw the image? You know? uh, and, and what are you looking for from, from these results of the Event Horizon Telescope? Is it in any way relevant to the, the things that you are studying? Uh, I study Sagittarius A star, which is our own galactic center yes. black holes, so M87 is not particularly re relevant for this. But I think it was a sense of, so say, a relief again, because, um, you know, it's in some sense it's a proof of technology, because if the first image would show you something you completely don't expect, the first thing you'll start arguing about is what went wrong with observations. Yes. So if the first image you see is actually what you expect, it's been great. If the next one's going to be different, then you can actually dive into understanding. So when, when at some point the results from Secretarius will come, what, what are the kind of features that you will be particularly looking at? Oh, it's uh, very interesting. First of all, um, they'll be able to see which direction it rotates very close to the black hole. Is it similar the direction to what we expect from other observations, from my observation, from other the hot spots orbiting because f for me it looks as uh, almost age on for them it looks as almost face on mm -hmm. 
and also we don't know if there is a jet in Sagittarius A star, so maybe we'll see a jet because there's been discussions about it for a long time. And actually, going even further, uh, there are discussions if there is a disk at all. Mm -hmm. So maybe the structures we see are temporaries, and they'll be able to tell us. Uh, where are you hoping to see in these images uh, and, and other observations also uh, at least the beginning of the jet? Or maybe because I think there's no jet visible, right, in the M87. Uh, Dimitri, was that something you were looking for? Or was uh, that realistic to expect? We, we didn't know whether we were going to see the bright ring surrounding the black hole shadow, as, which is what we saw, or we'll see the footprint of the jet. And by the way, this is something that might change because those jets come out in like this blobby way. So when a new blob comes out, maybe when we repeat the observation, we have observations in 2018, 2020, then maybe we will see that uh, image changing into a blob that's starting ejecting from the black hole. That will be amazing to see. Tim, I just want to ask you, uh, um, well, tell us a little bit also. I think the, the, the telescopes, of the ASO telescopes have been quite crucial in this. So tell us something about that, but also what are the challenges to really have these kind of literally global collaborations and, and, and linking these telescopes, uh, both from a, perhaps a technical but also from an organizational point of view? That's two, thank you, that's two rather different questions. Yes. Um, because the first question is about the telescopes on Paranal yes. that Scott showed. And the second is about linking up ALMA, in which ESO and the United States and Japan are, are members, and yeah. linking them with others. So let me first uh, try to answer the first one. So the VLT was built in the late 1990s with the idea of doing interferometry built in from the start. That's why these four eight-meter telescopes are in particular positions. That's why all the tunnels are there, where the light can go through, as Scott showed in the slide and then it was a matter of building the instrumentation. And indeed, after the previous passage of the star in 2002, a team said, look, we can do better uh, and use, really do an experiment on the galactic center with the four eight-meter telescopes. Uh, I had the pleasure to approve this. It was a no-brainer because you could not do this anywhere else, and it's a really exciting topic, as we've heard. Um, they finished the project on time. We had to refurbish the four telescopes and how everything works because it's really, really difficult. It was like seeing a, a euro coin on the moon. Uh, I, I want to talk with Scott offline about his skills. And <laughs> he went only to Mecca, I, but we'll talk about that later. So For you, it was a euro coin, uh, uh, not well, a quarter. Are, <laughs> yeah, or a quarter. Um, but came out was much better than we expected. Um, these, the star, you could follow it day by day. But what you could then also do is say, okay, I see the orbit of the star. Uh, I know the distance very carefully to this central object that now and then flares, that was also visible in Scott's little movie. And we then looked at what, where the flare actually is. And that seems to rotate around the center black hole in about 45 minutes at a third of the speed of light. And it's clockwise. So one prediction would be, once Dimitrios gets his data out, that you will see a ring and it will be clockwise so we can predict which side is bright and which side is not. Mm -hmm. If it's the opposite, then we don't understand something. But that's the prediction. So it was really a, a long project, but it worked. The other one, of doing the EHT is a very interesting experiment, as you already alluded to. Um, it was possible because of ALMA. Yeah, because ALMA was a critical component. Critical right? because it's so sensitive. And why is it so sensitive? Because there are 66, 54, 12 meter antennas that, that operate together. Just for uh, in terms of scale, if you would think of the kind of virtual size of that telescope, what is the size? About. Um, I need to do this in miles, I suppose, six or eight miles. <laughs> yes. yes. Wow. And um, on a beautiful site, 5,000 meters, your brain doesn't work there very well, but the telescopes do. Um, <laughs> and then you hook these up in the way described with telescopes around the world. And as uh, Dimitrios said and, and Scott, uh, weather should be good at all the sites. So you have these natural things that have to work in your favor. 
you have to agree with the observatory directors that okay, we're all going to look at the same thing at the same in the same period, and it leads to fascinating discussions. Uh, the biggest telescope, which cost a billion and a half to build, ALMA, international partnership, at one point was told uh, by the director of a really very small telescope on the North American continent that, well, uh, he didn't care, but it's those, that week uh, ALMA should be available for his project. Um, in the end, this was done, but you can imagine this leads to some discussions about who is going to set the schedule. And I think I said that fairly, isn't it? <laughs> Close <laughs> enough. <laughs> it but was it not worked. me. It was not me. No, By no, the way, how, <laughs> how lucky were you that you had at all these locations four nights of clear weather? I mean, that sounds like pretty bizarre, including the South Pole. Well, at least it was, you know, at the South Pole, that for six months it's dark, and for six months it's light, so yes. the, the, the things change not very fast. But, um, and at these wavelengths you can do it. But um, it was somewhat unusual, but it does happen. Mm. Um. Dimitri, I mean, um, what will be the next phase in kind of building this? I've heard about adding, adding telescopes. Can we kind of improve the resolution of these images? So we have three goals in the next you know, few to 10 to 20 years. One is that we're adding more telescopes. You cannot improve the resolution because you know, we, still, we already got the Earth from side to side, but we add more pieces of the telescope, so we improve the fidelity of the, of the image without improving the resolution. The second thing is that we're going to do the observation at a different frequency because the shadow should be there whatever frequency of observations you're going mm -hmm. to see. And the third one is maybe 20 years from now we want to put telescopes in space. In space. Because the minute you start going about a third of the distance to the moon, then uh, you get to do that example, that experiment with about 30 black holes that we know of in the universe. And that because you increasingly to, are then you increase the adding the size. Yeah. Of course, the big problem is, as you said, or as Scott said, uh, we're sending the data by FedEx trucks, literally, and FedEx has, is not going to space yet. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> that, that is our biggest problem. It's data transport is our biggest problem right now. You know, you cannot beat a 747 filled with hard drives. Yes. You know, there's not, no way to beat that bandwidth. Scott, just uh, turning to you, um, uh, are you still, I think your mic might still work. Well, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. We'll see. We'll do the experiment. Um, so what would you say, you know, in terms of the, the role of black holes in, just in the history of the universe, formation of galaxies, the formation of black holes itself, what are kind of the really open, open questions? What do we know for sure and what's kind of unknown? Well, I, we, we know that we know rough, the things we know are, we know roughly the overall density of black holes. We know roughly how the black hole, how the black hole is correlated with the properties of the galaxies. Uh, we know roughly when they formed. Um, what we don't know, as I said, is the degree to which the enormous energy released from the black hole feeds back into the uh, evolution and the formation of the galaxies. Can galaxy you just explain itself. that? How can that energy feed back? What, what are the mechanisms that kind of capture that energy? Well, if, if a significant fraction of the energy comes out in something like a jet, then uh, that jet will blast at relativistic speeds into the gas in the rest of the galaxy. Uh, and then one possibility is that the gas, the jet will just punch through and go off uh, into intergalactic space without having much effect except in a small region of the galaxy. The other is that it will shock and form a bubble of hot gas um, which may eventually uh, blow out of the galaxy. If that happens, it can remove all of the raw material uh, for making stars and basically turn off the star formation in the galaxy. And so an extreme point of view might be that the, the activity from the black hole is what changes galaxies like ours with plenty of gas and star formation into galaxies like M87 that are basically dead. Fascinating. Uh, Lina, I, I was wondering, that we, and we have heard quite, quite a few seminars here too about like fundamental issues of black holes, you know, what they mean in terms of the theoretical aspects, etc. To which extent do you think in the future observations will tell us something about these more fundamental questions about you know, well, you what black holes are, how they deal with information, is, are quantum mechanical effects important? How do you see these two 
Uh, you fields. mean the general relativity and the observation of the black holes will be able to tell us, say, you know, what's the quantum gravity theory is right or wrong? Uh, I believe uh, because theoretical black holes, we can't actually see them. It would be nice, but we cannot create them in a lab and we cannot uh, probe them. So the only black holes we can actually see are those. Yes. The better we understand how the material around them swirls and how much you light get from which side and how it's supposed to look, the more you'll be able to peer and look into the, how the gravity itself works. So when you start, when you refine this technique of observing the black hole shadows and uh, get the high resolution and get high predictions, you'll be able to see weird stuff. And if you understand how jets work, then you'll be able to say, well, maybe this general relativity maybe is not exactly predict the motions around this region. Maybe there is something else. So this is a very precise check also of Einstein's theory and... Uh, uh, I would believe so because there is yeah. no other way we can see at the scales of the event horizon. Dimitri, do you feel that we now have proven the existence of black holes? Or is there still a shadow of a doubt? Uh, <laughs> pun intended. Yeah. So we have proven that whatever is in the centers of galaxies that is extremely massive, billions of solar masses, uh, puts, casts a shadow just like the ones that black mm -hmm. holes are predicted to do. I'm trying to be very diplomatic here because just like with everything else, right? Newton gave a theory for the solar system. It worked beautifully, but there was a very, very minor problem mm -hmm. with the orbit of Mercury. And nobody for a hundred years paid much attention to it, but that was the point where the whole theory got unraveled and we had the theory of general relativity and Einstein you know, predicted it. So we're getting there with black holes, but we're not there to be at the level to be able to tell for sure. Great. I want to open the discussion for questions. So this is the moment to ask anything you want to ask about black holes because we have four experts in the audience. I see some questions here in front. Do we have a microphone? Sir, you first, and then there's one over there. Yeah. It's on. Um, first of all, this was a mind-blowing lecture. I feel privileged uh, to, to live in the area to to come and, uh, you know, uh, see things like this. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thanks to all of you. Um, I heard in the lecture uh, that uh, the, uh, the galaxies are uh, like disks. Is the universe also like flat? And, and is there a uh, uh, black hole in the center of the universe? You know, like mother of all black holes. <laughs> not associated with any galaxy. So, so the, yeah. the many, many, but not all of the galaxies are uh, flat disks. Um, the universe as a whole is much more homogeneous. Uh, it seems to be completely isotropic. On the largest scales, it's the same in any direction you look. Um, it doesn't have a center, so there might be such a mother of all black holes somewhere in the universe, but uh, you know, there's, there's no evidence for it. So you know, I, the, I, I kept saying that black holes are in the center of, centers of galaxies, but to some extent we're the drunkards looking for his keys on, under, on, under the light post. <laughs> if, if there are similar black holes in between the galaxies or even some distance out in the galaxies, they would be extremely hard to find. And so there might be additional uh, of black holes, even comparable total numbers and masses of black holes in regions where they're not accreting any gas, not giving off any light, not affecting the stars, you just don't know. Tim, what's the largest black hole that we know that exists? We've seen one which was, what is five billion? So the, the one in M87 is six and a half million, six and sorry, six and a half billion uh, solar masses and um, measurements have been done of objects that are less than a factor two bigger, so up to 10 billion solar masses. Those measurements are not extremely accurate. So M87 is, I would say, towards the top of the, the mass distribution, yeah. but not necessarily the largest. Great, another question here. Please. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the lecture and the discussion. Um, I, I had a couple questions. Uh, first, I see in the image that there are two peaks in intensity, and in the uh, 
simulation, it seemed like there was one. I was wondering if that had significance and if there are proposed explanations for that. Um, additionally, I was wondering what the uh, potential interaction with, say, the uh, LIGO experiment might be um, in the future. Great. Perhaps start, uh, Dimitrios, we take the first question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the very nice uh, eyesight to look at the various peaks. So that blob is structure in the image is not something that we should really pay too much attention to it. It is a little bit related to where we put telescopes. Where you put telescopes in the Earth, let's say you get a little brighter emission. So that brightness, as a usual brightness structure, is not really uh, something to pay attention. The fact that the north is dim and the south is bright, that is definitely something that we believe in. You know, this is not the first time that we had black holes on the front page of newspapers, like with the LIGO uh, observatory. Can you explain a little bit what the difference is between these black holes and the black holes that we are talking about tonight? Uh, tonight we're talking about black holes in the center of the galaxies. Those are very, very large black holes. They have billions of solar masses. Uh, when uh, you look at the newspapers and read about the LIGO news, those are stellar mass black holes, the black holes which has the masses of several suns, 30 solar masses, uh, or smaller, if the news starts. Uh, those uh, stellar sized black holes. So those stellar sized black holes, they're much more, um, they're much denser. If you can imagine, if you say what's the size of the black hole you expect, you expect a huge density within the event horizon side. For, and those, if you try to dive into black holes for stellar size, for example, you are going to be shredded into pieces. But if you try to dive into black holes in the center of M87 galaxy, you barely notice the transition because the density side of those black holes are much less. It's the size of our, it's roughly the size of our solar system, right? A few factors. Yeah, the solar and the system, density yeah. inside is pretty similar to the density of water. Yes. If you just divide the mass by the radius. Tim, uh, we, can we, uh, why aren't we also seeing uh, colliding supermassive black holes? Or hearing supermassive black holes colliding? So my understanding is that um, LIGO uh, listens to the universe with gravitational waves. We have these little chirps. Um, and the frequencies that it is um, sensitive to uh, match the frequencies that occur when you uh, merge two stellar mass black holes. If you wanted to do this for the supermassive black holes, the frequencies are much lower, um, the wavelengths are much longer, and you would therefore have to build a version of LIGO that has uh, not four kilometers or two and a half miles of tunnel in which you bounce the light back and forth, but uh, it would be uh, three million miles. Would be the size of our solar system. <coughs> yes, and that is yeah. actually going to happen. Uh -huh. uh, the European Space Agency is leading a project called ELISA, where uh, they will essentially build a version of LIGO in space. Uh, it's not connected tubes with, with its mirrors that are three million miles apart that bounce light back and forth, and they will be able, once that is launched in 15 years time maybe, that should then be able to detect the similar events, but for the supermassive black holes. It's quite mind boggling. Scott, what is the predictions for that? Do we think these supermassive black holes collide? Um, we, we do, and uh, you know, Lisa is, a, is a, a wonderful experiment. It's a long way away, but I'm eating my vegetables every day, and I hope that I'll uh, uh, live to, to see the results. In, in the nearer term, you may also be able to detect uh, merging black holes by uh, very precise measurements of the uh, locations of pulsars, and there's a network of radio observatories that are trying to make those measurements. So, you know, maybe in a few years there will be another press release uh, in which they say that those, those mergers have been identified that will precede the, uh, uh, the, the, the chance to fly Lisa. It will be like the merger of the two other press releases. So. <laughs> I think there's a question in the back. Yes. Uh, Stephen Hawking has uh, theorized that black holes will evaporate over time. Is there anything that you've seen in your observe, observation of black holes that would show the remains of what existed after a black hole disappeared? Like globular clusters without a mass in the center, 
something to show that black hole actually evaporated. Lena, you want to say something about it? Uh, first of all, when black hole evaporates, there will be nothing left there, so it's going to be just normal space. Second uh, situation is we actually haven't seen the Hawking radiation because the black holes which we see in space, they're surrounded by the gas. So there is so much um, material falling in and radiating while it's doing this. So the Hawking radiation is completely overwhelmed by the amount of stuff falling in. So no, we haven't seen any black holes which, we haven't observed any black hole evaporation because so far th there is enough material in the universe to dump stuff into the black hole rather than, you know, get, evaporate them. I don't know, and I Hawking radiation is more intense with smaller black holes. Yes. So yes. in some sense, we're looking exactly at the wrong category, right? Yes, we're looking true. at the largest. Exactly. Perhaps one final question there to the right. Yes. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, these black holes are very dense. Can you give us an idea about what kind of density uh, values are we talking about? In, you know, Lenny, you want to follow up? Uh, sure. The s I think Scott, during his lecture, said if you compress the size, uh, the sound to the b size of about one mile, well, that uh, should give you an idea of the density. And uh, I mean, more than you've ever s we've ever seen on Earth. It's more than the density of the nuclei. It's you compress nuclei more and more and more and more. The atomic nuclear. Uh, yeah, sorry, I mean the atomic nuclear. Sure. Perhaps I want to kind of finish by asking all four of you uh, if you want to, uh, just improvising here, if you want to pick kind of one question that you uh, want to see answered in, in, in the near future about black holes, what would be your favorite? Starting with you, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be really, really good to see the, the details of the process that Scott has described in the accretion disk. I think there's no question, well, let's put it differently. Uh, as Scott put it, uh, we haven't, and Dimitrios as well, we haven't fully, fully proven that there are black holes, but we also don't know any other object that it could be. So by Occam's razor, we know there are black holes, and then the question really becomes, okay, how does this whole thing work yeah. with the accretion disk, launching the jet, and all of that? And that I think there might be some really crazy surprises in store. There might that did not like all the... Because the only thing we have seen up to now are computer-generated simulations, right, of these disks. Yes, uh, the observations I alluded to, and also these ones, yeah. they start showing, and what, what Elena described, yeah. They start showing pieces of that picture. There usually are surprises in astronomy, so I keep an open mind. Great. Lena, your, perhaps your question was already stolen, but what? Uh, no, my question is not stolen. Okay. I will more well try to not to steal, steal anyone else's questions. Um, any question about the black holes, right? Yeah. So I want to know if general relativity is the theory and how to quantize it. Terrific. So, <laughs> <laughs> Your old passion, <laughs> Dimitrios. I guess if you want to stay within general relativity, we know that general relativity has an infinite number of black hole-like solutions. We call them naked singularities, mm -hmm. and we hate them. We really do not like them because we don't know what, what to do with them. And they would all show shadows. How can we tell that what we saw was an actual black hole as opposed to those solutions that we don't like? Great. Scott, you have the last word. Despite her best intentions, Lena stole my question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then, uh, I think it's a good moment to thank our panel. And thank you so much for attending us.